Yeah, we are on live now. Okay. Uh, so we should start the session in one minute. Uh, it uh, will begin at one minute. Okay. Yeah, I think we can uh, have start. Have a start. Abigna? Yeah, I'm clear. Yes. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone, distinguished participants, ladies, and gentlemen. I'm pleased to welcome you to the webinar on Executive Conservation of Horticultural Genetic Resources for Livelihood and Nutritional Security. In this virtual conference, I see such amazing guests and dignitaries from around the world sharing same interests and enlightening one another with the advancing in the field of agriculture. I'm sure we are also reaching out to many new practitioners, technologists, innovators, business professionals, and civil society representatives, fellow mates, and many more people. A warm welcome to you all. We all understand the importance of science technology and innovation in our daily lives and ways in which they are transforming the world. If this was not clear earlier, it is blindingly obvious now alongside the intricacies arising with the art at hand. Science, technology and innovation are indispensable for our response to and upliftment from the current and forthcoming scenarios. Equally important are deployment of scientific inventions, innovations, and technological solutions on a scale that will reach the target audience. Why here? Why today? What is the purpose? We are all embraced by the presence of the distinguished and well-rounded dignitaries to shed some light upon the varied measures to be taken under consideration for the distinct genomes. All our online webinars aim to discuss leading edge technologies and recent scientific developments in addition to the immediate challenges in agriculture and elite sectors. The idea is to familiarize students and professionals about current research trends, relevant and pioneering technologies in plant genomics for high level analysis and interdisciplinary areas that are embraced in leading laboratories by excellent scientists. Plant Genomia is a nonprofit organization promoting and publicizing plant sciences and investigations in the field of agriculture across the globe. We organize various webinars and developments comprehending plant research for all the students, researchers, industrialists, and professors internationally. Here at Plant Genomia, we hold a global team of reputed scientists and research scholars from various parts of the world, distinct parts of India, the United States of America, United Kingdom, Nigeria, Philippines, and Spain, etc. Technical support is laid to us by scholars from the Department of Genetics and Plant Breeding. Our motto is to disseminate every bit of knowledge among all. We believe that no research is accomplished until broadcasted, and that it is an ongoing process through layers and lapses of time. Now, I would like to extend my heartiest welcome to the senior dignitary, Dr. P. Rajeshekaran, Principal Scientist, Indian Institute of Horticultural Research, Bengaluru. The core subject specialist team, the core support team, our esteemed founder, Mr. Alamuru Krishna Chaitanya, and the lovely audience. Before we begin, let me clarify the process of attaining the certificate. The certificate application form will be shared any time during the webinar. Filling that form is mandatory to have the certificate. Please do not ask for certificates frequently while the session is in progress, as other delegates may feel disturbed. We shall surely be providing the certificates. Do not worry and kindly note that the previous webinar certificates will be updated and issued by tomorrow evening in our website. 
Now we have the much admired founder of Plant Genomia, Mr. Alamuru Krishna Chaitanya, to address the audience and guests present with us today, and to remark the initiative taken up by Plant Genomia and his team. Over to Chaitanya. Thanks, Abigna. I hope I'm audible and clear. Yes, you are. Yeah, fine. Good morning, afternoon, and good evening to everyone who are watching us here in this virtual gathering all over the world. Welcome you all once again on behalf of Complete Plant Genomia and Team. I am delighted to say you that Plant Genomia received a good number of registrations from various countries across the globe. We had achieved a good record of statistics from our previous webinars, and almost 32,000 plus people watched our webinars from 98 plus countries, and it was so amazing and delighted to share with you. With an aim to promote, promote plant science research, Plant Genome is organizing the talks from internationally renowned scientists who are well known for their research skills. Also, very soon, by this month ending, we are about to launch our scientific forum for getting the guidance from scientists to the selected participants in writing various scientific manuscripts, papers, oh, wow. books, chapters, proposals, and many more in the various disciplines of agriculture. Plant Genomia is all about knowledge dissemination and would be a package of library of several such initiatives in the near future. We thank you for all kind and support for participating in these webinars. I must truly thank all the scientists and speakers for the guidance and encouragement to do many such activities. Today, we had a well-renowned speaker who is a talented scientist and an efficient researcher going to deliver a talk on ex situ conservation of horticultural genetic resources for livelihood and nutritional security. This topic is very crucial as there are a lot of challenges and intricacies arising due to the global climate change. Conservation of horticulture genetic resources play a major role in meeting these, although it is quite challenging. At 74th session of the United Nations General Assembly, 2020-21 proclaimed as the International Year of Fruits and Vegetables. In this way, this year is a unique opportunity to raise the awareness on the important role of fruits and vegetables in human nutrition, food security and health, and as well as in achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I am glad that today's speaker, Dr. Rajashekaran, Principal Scientist from ICRIHR Bengaluru, has chosen this interesting topic to provide the insights regarding conservation of such horticultural genetic resources for better livelihood and achieving the nutritional security. I heartfully thank Dr. P. E. Rajashekaran, sir, for accepting our kind invitation in very less time out of his very busy schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Abhigna. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Alamuru. Those were some very gripping words coming from you. While we are presenting a gesture of gratitude, I would also like to thank Dr. K.P. Vishwanathan, former Vice Chancellor of Mahatma Phule Krishi Vidyapeet, Rauri, and Dr. K.V. Peter, former Vice Chancellor of Kerala Agriculture University, for giving the valuable forward message on Plant Genomia webinar. Before we begin, I would like to call upon Dr. Sujeshri, Chief Operating Officer of Plant Genomia from Indian Agriculture Research Institute, New Delhi, to introduce our revered speaker, Dr. P. Rajashekran. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Abhikna. On behalf of Plant Genomia, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. P. Rajshagran. Dr. P. Rajshagran is a principal scientist at ICR Indian Institute of Horticulture Research, Bangalore, Karnataka, India. He has 36 years of research experience in the field of horticulture, plantation crops, spices, and medicinal plants. His research interest comprises of conservation of medicinal plant biodiversity oh, yeah. using ex situ approaches. Uh, like in in vitro conservation, cryopreservation, bioprospecting of medicinal plants, applying the modern techniques, policy issues related to plant genetic resources, and IPR, ITK, CBD, uh, W2, and on. Uh, it, he is involved in multiple collaborative and partnership research in projects like bioprospecting of wild germplasm of several plants, preventing the extinction and improving the conservation status of threatened plants through application of biotechnological tools and uh, agrobiodiversity platforms, and so on. He has international recognitions at various countries like Japan, USA, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and all, with invitations to engage in IPGRA and ISHS workshops. Also, he is closely associated in scientific collaborations with networks like Indian Association for Angiosperm Taxonomy and Indian Society for Plant Genetic Resources, NBPGR, New Delhi. In addition, he is acting as an advisory member in various national organizations functioning for conservation of plant genetic resources. 
Moreover, he has more than 300 research publications and acting as a reviewer and editorial team member of many Indian and international journal, which is a measure of his scientific achievement and productivity. Sir, it is our extreme pleasure to have you today. And now I request you to share your screen to our audiences and proceed with the talk. Thank you, sir, and over to you. Yeah, thank you. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, it is visible. Shall I proceed? Yes, sir, you can proceed. Yeah. Very good morning uh, to all of you. First of all, I would like to ex express my sincere gratitude to the Plant Genomia platform for inviting me to share my uh, some of my research interests uh, with uh, you people. And the uh, topic I have chosen for uh, today's uh, lecture is ex situ conservation of horticultural genetic resources for livelihood and nutritional security. Now, the livelihood and nutritional security has become a very important issue uh, because we are in the <clears throat> pandemic situation where the livelihood is threatened and the nutritional security is also a problem. So the horticultural genetic resource uh, management and conservation becomes uh, very crucial at this juncture. And in uh, uh, my lecture, I would like to discuss the various conservation strategies and what is the world scenario of uh, plant genetic resources, including horticultural genetic resources, and the conservation of horticultural genetic resources uh, carried out at uh, Indian Institute of Horticulture Research. And we have a pollen crab bank, an in vitro gene bank, and uh, I will be talking about a uh, <clears throat> or the conservation of uh, Madhuka insignia is a critically endangered species as a case study. Then I will uh, conclude my uh, uh, talk with that. Now, uh, if you see the horticulture uh, scenario in India, uh, now the production of horticulture crops uh, uh, overtaken the uh, production of uh, uh, coming uh, compared to the cereal production. So now the uh, you can see from this slide from 2004 to uh, 2007 there is a, a rapid increase in the production of uh, horticultural crops. Uh, that is a good scenario. Now we our food basket also getting changed. Now uh, we are not only eating the cereals, we are uh, started eating fruits and vegetables and uh, the uh, production of fruits and vegetables also increase in many folds. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, India, uh, you know, consists of uh, sm small farmers and uh, they are the uh, core of the Indian agriculture compared to the countries like uh, US and uh, Europe. There the holdings are big, but here the holdings are very small. And, uh, you know, we have the marginal, small, semi, medium and medium. Uh, farmers and 85% uh, of the farmers are having less than uh, two hectares of uh, cultivated land and the 77 districts have more than 70% of the uh, small holders. Now, uh, we have a lot of uh, indigenous fruit crops uh, in India. You can see here the jackfruit, tamarind, then karonda, jamun, uh, source of all these are having a lot of uh, medicinal properties. And uh, now uh, people have started cultivating this and uh, marketing these uh, fruits. And uh, exploring the uh, garden of uh, biofortified crops, uh, you know, these crops are rich in iron, uh, vitamins, uh, folic acid, zinc, and these are all very valuable for our uh, uh, nutrition. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, now people started taking these uh, uh, fruits for uh, the, you know, the benefits which they are uh, uh, giving. Now, uh, uh, some <clears throat> exposition on the Indian Institute of Horticulture Research. It was established in 1967 and uh, it is the uh, biggest horticulture institute in Asia and we are working on 54 crops, uh, fruits, medicinal, uh, vegetable, ornamental, 
and uh, uh, the other related crops. And we have two uh, central uh, horticultural experiment, experimental station, one at uh, located in Bhuvaneswar and another one at Chatali, uh, Karnataka. And we have two Krishi Vigyan Kendras. One is located at Bronikopa and the other one uh, at uh, Hirehalli. And uh, uh, we are for the cause of the farmers always. And uh, we uh, used to conduct of conduct a you know, uh, lot of genetic diversity fairs for uh, mango, jackfruit. Then recently we had one for uh, the uh, exotic dragon fruit. And uh, this used to attract a uh, lot of uh, farmers and other uh, public. And uh, uh, last year we had a very successful uh, uh, <clears throat> Horticulture, National Horticulture Fair. This was uh, attracted uh, 55 lakh of uh, people from 23 countries. And uh, we have both, uh, uh, you know, it was done in a hybrid way, both uh, offline and online. Online, uh, we could attract a lot of people and uh, 60,000 farmers visited this uh, horticulture fair. So we uh, celebrated our uh, uh, Golden Jubilee in the year 2017. So uh, we have uh, uh, come across. Uh, we we have now uh, uh, going for the you know next. Uh, and uh, as I was mentioning, we in the horticulture there is a lot of diversity. We have fruits, spices, vegetable, medicinal, aromatic crops, and uh, uh, flower crops. All this. Uh, are under the hot, uh, umbrella of horticulture and uh, horticulture is very uh, complex and uh, the conservation of horticultural genetics uh, also very challenging. Uh, if you take the share of India in the world of horticulture, uh, it's uh, abysmally low, only 2% and the rest of the world contribute the 98%. And uh, uh, if you take the global issues identified in uh, horticulture, and the genetic resource conservation and development is one among them uh, compared to the other issues which are mentioned here. And uh, as uh, the uh, CEO mentioned, the, uh, the world population is growing uh, uh, in a, a tremendous fashion. And uh, this is creating an issue for how to uh, feed this millions and uh, climate change is also another issue if you uh, take one percent average temperature increase there is a two percent decrease in the agricultural production so this is also creating a lot of problem and uh, climate change is uh, you know very apparent and it is creating problem for the agriculture and horticulture and uh, it is affecting the production of uh, many crops so what is the approach uh, we have for the conservation so prospecting for high yielding sources of uh, non-metabolites. We now we are moving from, uh, you know, we are looking for the, uh, in the crops, we are looking for the metabolites, how it can help improve the health of the uh, people, how to, how it can improve the health, uh, the, you know, disease, uh, how, how we can treat the disease uh, by taking good food. So, uh, uh, while considering that we should be able to locate the population and develop population atlas for the crops and develop chemical profile of the species and population and uh, uh, developing genetic profile of the species as uh, uh, some most of you mentioned then go for the ex situ conservation and uh, uh, this is the uh, strategy we adopt for the conservation of uh, any species. Uh, it is a, a, a common uh, chart, and it was developed by uh, Max, uh, Max, Max Ted, uh, scientist from uh, UK. And uh, uh, normally, what we do is we select the target taxa, then uh, we have the project, then we do the ecogeographical surveys. Uh, uh, for uh, locating the population, then we develop the conservation uh, objectives and we do the uh, field of uh, exploration to collect the uh, different uh, accessions from the field. Then we go for the conservation. So conservation mainly done in ex situ conditions and in situ conditions. Of course, the in situ, we don't have uh, uh, <clears throat> We are not doing the in situ conservation. It is with the uh, 
Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India. And uh, we normally do the ex situ conservation of the genetic resources we collected from different places. And uh, these we uh, do by uh, storing the seeds. That is the easiest way to do it. Then we have the field gene bank for the vegetatively cultivated species, then botanic garden for the wild species. Then those who are not able to uh, produce seeds, we go for the in vitro. Then uh, as a supplementary uh, conservation strategy, we do the pollen storage. And of course, now DNA storage is also come into being and is helping for uh, you know different uh, biotechnological activities. So uh, ultimately, we are getting the conservation products in the form of seeds, uh, plants, in vitro plants, etc. And the conserved product uh, is uh, uh, deposited and disseminated. And uh, uh, we do the characterization. And the, uh, ultimately, we should be able to use these uh, resources for uh, breeding and uh, biotechnological activities. So this is the common uh, flow chart for the conservation of any species. And uh, uh, you know, we will go into the details of different uh, conservation strategies in the coming slides. So uh, what are the different forms of uh, conservation? We can conserve in the form of whole plant. Then we can conserve seed planlets in uh, the tissue culture that is we call it in vitro conservation using the explants then we have the pollen and uh, uh, DNA. So in uh, this slide you can see the uh, strategies for uh, conservation uh, though we are not doing in situ conservation but in situ conservation is the best form of conservation because in the ex situ conservation, we are not allowing the plants to evolve. And in the era of climate change, the uh, evolution is very important. And if plants are not able to, plant species are not able to evolve, it may not be able to survive. That is why many species are, if you see the latest IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources uh, red list, you can see many species are finding place in the uh, IUCN red list. So in situ conservation is the best method and uh, now the uh, concept of conservation is also getting changed and uh, we are going for in situ conservation for the crop species also and I will come into that uh, in the uh, coming slides and the in situ conservation normally practiced by the uh, by uh, establishing biosphere uh, resource, uh, reserves in fact, we are in the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserves. Uh, Western Ghat is part of the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve and the national parks. Um, and especially for conserving the wild species, we have the national parks. Genes are uh, sanctuaries, for example. There is a gene sanctuary to conserve the uh, <coughs> citrus genetic resources in Northeast. Then, as I mentioned, on farm conservation are coming in a big way for the conservation of. Uh, uh, cultivated species that is with the help of the farmers we, because farmers are the custodians of the genetic resources and without their help we cannot do the conservation on farm and uh, uh, now on farm conservation is coming in a big way for the uh, cereals and other related species but for the horticultural crops uh, it is still we have to go a long way and uh, coming to the ex situ conservation which uh, uh, we are doing for the last uh, uh, 30 35 years. We have established a field gene bank for most of the crops at IHR. Then we have the seed bank, gene bank for the species which are producing the uh, orthodox seeds. The uh, only orthodox seeds you can conserve in the seed bank. And there, uh, the uh, moisture content of the seed is reduced from less than 10%, 5 to 8%. And uh, those seeds you can store at minus 20 uh, or minus 18 for the 50 or 100 years. In fact, our National Gene Bank located at uh, National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, they store uh, the uh, seeds in their gene bank. Then we have developed the in vitro gene bank for the vegetatively propagated seeds which are not producing the seeds. Then the latest uh, uh, of the conservation strategy is using the cryopreservation that we call cryopreservation uh, using liquid nitrogen. Then now in BPGR is also having the DNA bank, uh, you know, you have isolated DNA and that can be conserved for a long period 
and it can be used for inserting the specific gene in different crops. So in short, these are the different conservation strategies one can adopt for uh, different crop species based on the need and based on the technology available, you can choose uh, uh, one among these. Or uh, and they, for any species, the conservation strategy uh, should be able to conserve maximum genetic diversity. So we'll be able to use now or in the future. So uh, one technique may not be sufficient to conserve the entire gene pool of a given species. So what we do is we go for uh, uh, more than one conservation strategy to conserve the maximum genetic diversity in a given species. And of course, uh, uh, that is the only way you can have the maximum genetic diversity conserved. So now, uh, 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 as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, we have the seed banks, we have the cryo banks, we have the in vitro banks, we have the field gene banks for the clonally propagated species, R2 species, and uh, we have the cell line also. Uh, the in vitro gene bank, in the in vitro gene bank, you can conserve the resources uh, medium term uh, conservation, and that is uh, two years, five years you can conserve. And for long term conservation, you have to go for the uh, cryo gene bank using uh, liquid nitrogen. So now uh, the simple model of plant genetic conservation, we have the gene pool, the total genetic resource available for a given species, and then you conserve it and uh, utilize. The conservation is the process that actively retains the diversity of the gene pool with a view to actual or potential utilization. And utilization is the human exploitation of that genetic diversity. So uh, ultimately, uh, we should be able to use the resources which are conserved in different uh, uh, forms. Then the uh, conservation strategy, and I will go to the definition of ex situ conservation. And the ex situ conservation means the conservation of the uh, component of uh, biological diversity outside their natural habitat. In fact, uh, different plants occur at different habitats and some of them are niche specific and that will be difficult to store uh, in the ex situ conditions. So in situ conservation means the conservation of ecosystem and natural habitat and the recovery of viable population of the species in their natural surroundings. And in the case of domestic case or cultivated species, the surrounding where they have developed their distinct properties. As I mentioned, in situ conservation is the best uh, form of conservation, but the difficulty is, uh, you know, you do, we don't have much land for the uh, in situ conservation. And uh, for the cross species, it is difficult to conserve in situ, but now uh, we have developed models for uh, uh, the species, how to conserve the uh, species using in situ conservation strategies. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, using one technology or one technique, you cannot conserve the entire gene pool of a given species. So the ex situ conservation is a complementary approach, uh, means uh, you can have one or two techniques together and conserve the maximum genetic diversity and uh, 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 little space and uh, uh, you know the considerable period of time you should be able to conserve. And, uh, uh, it should be less vulnerable to the catastrophes which they are going to face. So uh, uh, if you see the conservation strategies, ex situ, we have the seed storage, we have the in vitro DNA, pollen, field in bank, and botanic garden. In situ, we have the genetic reserve, uh, reserve on farm, and home garden. And uh, home garden is also one form of uh, conservation. You can see in Kerala and in Northeast, uh, most of the homes are having the home garden. There are uh, 15 to 30 species are uh, getting cancer. That is for the use. And uh, uh, in uh, Kerala and Northeast, you will find uh, a lot of diversity in this home garden. So some of the uh, species uh, you can conserve in the home garden also. So in the ex situ techniques, genetic variation is maintained away from its original location, which I have already mentioned. And these techniques are generally appropriate for the conservation of crops, crop relatives, and wild species. Now, the crop relatives and wild uh, uh, species are also gaining importance because how to handle the uh, you know, climate change? We have facing a lot of biotic and abiotic stress 
And uh, to overcome this abiotic and uh, biotic stress, our only way is to look for the resistant genes or the tolerant genes in these wild species. And uh, uh, using tech, uh, biotechnological uh, tools, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, transfer these genes to the cross species and uh, uh, we can induce the resistance or tolerance, whatever it may be. And uh, you can cultivate this uh, species uh, without having much problem of biotic and abiotic stress. Peel in bank is uh, one method by which uh, you can conserve the tree species and other vegetatively propagated species. But one issue here is, uh, you know, it is facing all the uh, vagaries of nature and uh, you need a lot of space and to maintain a lot of uh, money is required. But still, uh, you know, we have to do this to conserve the, uh, the uh, fruit crops. In fact, at IHR, we have a field in bank for uh, most of the crops. Uh, fruit crop species like mango, jackfruit. In jackfruit, we have 72 collections from all over India, and uh, uh, we are conserved this uh, at the field gene bank. For each accession, we have uh, three replicates. And coming to the advantages and disadvantage of field gene bank. See, advantages are suitable for storing material of recalcitrant species. See, recalcitrant species are the uh, species in which the <clears throat> seed is seed uh, you know the seed moisture content cannot be reduced and the germination will take within one week or two weeks see for example if you take the jackfruit or mango you cannot uh, store these uh, seeds for a long period and the seed size also big uh, so these are all called uh, recalcitrant species and uh, easy access for characterization, evaluation, utilization is one of the advantage for the field gene bank. So you have to do the characterization to understand uh, what are the characters of the species, how uh, you know it looks like morphologically, and we use a, a descriptor for uh, characterizing. Then we go for the evaluation to understand whether it is having a biotic and abiotic stress resistance or how it. Uh, uh, behaves in uh, cultivated conditions and of course we should be able to utilize these resources. Of course the disadvantages are material is uh, susceptible to pest diseases and vandalism if it is exposed in the field and involves large areas of land as I mentioned and high maintenance cost. But still for some of the species we don't have the, say for example you take mango, we don't have the in vitro protocols. protocols protocols but for jackfruit we developed the metro protocol but still there are uh, problems to maintain this in the in the in vitro condition so we go for the field gene bank though these disadvantages and advantages are there and advantages i mentioned you can do the characterization and you can see how it performs in the field then coming to the in vitro gene bank uh, for uh, we we use it for collection see for example how to collect uh, the uh, you know uh, plantation crops like coconut. See now we developed uh, in vitro collection procedure for uh, uh, coconut. Earlier we used to collect nuts from uh, most of these collections are made from the islands located in uh, you know di uh, different uh, oceans and it is difficult to bring large collections in the form of uh, coconut. So we uh, the uh, CPCR, a Central Plantation Crops Research Institute, they developed a in vitro technique for the collection of, uh, you know, the uh, embryo collection of this uh, <clears throat> coconut, and it is easy to collect, and uh, you can collect uh, large samples from uh, the islands and bring to the main islands. And uh, now for the uh, banana, uh, cassava and other uh, sweet potato and uh, international exchange of jablasm is possible only in the form of uh, in vitro cultures. Otherwise, you know, the disease uh, spread is there. So to prevent that, the uh, Biodiversity International, which uh, uh, the UN agents, uh, the CGIR uh, Institute, which uh, uh, do the conservation of these genetic resources, they, uh, may, they are saying that the exchange of material only in the form of in vitro. So these are the advantage of uh, uh, in vitro techniques. The advantage uh, you can conserve, uh, especially for recalcitrant and sterile clonal species is the only way. And uh, you have the easy access. 
and of course there are disadvantages like uh, risk of somatoclonal variation if you do the tissue culture uh, uh, you know and you keep long time there is a chance of having this somatoclonal variation and there is a need to develop individual maintenance protocols for each species and that also take time and expertise is required and uh, relatively high level of technology and maintenance cost are involved in the in vitro conservation and uh, coming to the seed storage conservation it is a best form of conservation there is no doubt about it it's very efficient and reproducible and feasible for medium and long term storage of course uh, you know you can uh, store for uh, uh, 50 to 100 years without uh, losing the viability and wide diversity of each target taxon see for example you take the cereals all the genetic resources are conserved in the form of seed and it's easy to collect and conserve uh, and uh, uh, and easy to access this material and little maintenance once material is conserved but the uh, disadvantages are uh, problem uh, storing seeds of recalcitrant species which i already mentioned and uh, freezes the evolutionary uh, development that is one issue now uh, as i mentioned to overcome the uh, problem of uh, <clears throat> climate change uh, we should have the uh, you know uh, we should be uh, able to allow the evolution of the plant species which is not possible if you store the material in the form of seed then genetic diversity may be lost with each rege regeneration cycle see once in uh, 10 or 20 years we have to regenerate the seeds and uh, get the fresh seeds and able to conserve in that process uh, we lose uh, some of the genetic diversity for the i mean the seeds which we collect in the next generation may not be the same as the earlier one so in that process we lose the genetic uh, diversity now npdr has taken up the uh, you know regeneration for most of the seeds they conserve for the last uh, 30 40 years and uh, 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 the problem they are going to face is they may lose uh, some of the genetic diversity which was there in the original one. So seed bank, uh, uh, mostly it is a conventional uh, seed storage. There are uh, 1,750 uh, seed banks all over the world. And uh, uh, some of the seed banks uh, of uh, uh, USDA at the Fort Collins, USA, then the uh, seed bank of uh, uh, India is having the second largest seed bank, then China, Chinese Academy of Sciences, they have the third largest uh, seed bank. And uh, uh, the advantages are uh, uh, mostly the uh, gene bank in the uh, developing countries, they have the seed storage only. And the condition to prolong the seed longevity is mainly depend on seed moisture content. As I mentioned, uh, moisture content should be reduced to uh, 85%. Then you can store for 50 or 100 years. And the containers used also have an uh, uh, effect on the how long you can store the seeds. Then the optimum uh, stage of seed maturity, seed lot quality, processing and harvesting techniques, germination, ecophysiology also. Uh, you know, uh, have an effect on how long you can store the seeds. Orthodox seeds uh, tolerate drying. As I mentioned, the uh, recalcitrant seeds cannot tolerate the drying. That's the main problem. So it cannot be, uh, you know, it's not possible to reduce the moisture content. Because of that, you cannot store those seeds for long term. And the recalcitrant tree, see, uh, tree seeds are damaged by desiccation. And uh, there is one more classification, the intermediate seeds, see, for example, the, some of the uh, citrus uh, species having intermediate seeds, seeds that do not fit into either of these categories. So these are the three categories of seeds. Then uh, we have the DNA and pollen storage. Pollen storage, uh, we have made a headway in that, that I'll be discussing in details. And uh, DNA uh, also now, you know, NPPJR started uh, storing the DNA forms, uh, different DNA, different species uh, DNA forms are also stored. It is relatively easy and low cost conservation and uh, 
DNA, uh, re, uh, though the regeneration of entire plants from the DNA is not possible and uh, uh, problem with the subsequent gene isolation. Then pollen, we have only the paternal material and uh, uh, you know the uh, N material only is there, 2N is not there, it is haploid. But there are advantages that I'll be discussing uh, when this uh, topic comes. Now, uh, you may ask, what is the cost uh, involved in different uh, conservation strategies? If you take uh, uh, field, SCASAVA, for example, uh, the CJR Institute, CH, uh, as per their calculation, they spent uh, uh, 17.09 US dollars per accession. And in vitro, it is costly. CASAVA again from uh, CH. Uh, 26.22 US dollars. And uh, if you take seed of wheat and maize uh, uh, as per the CIMIT calculation, uh, it is very, very cheap. That is why, you know, uh, people adopt seed storage and uh, difficult to adopt the other techniques because the cost involved is much more compared to the seed storage. Then, uh, the basic question is why we should go for uh, conservation of these genetic resources. See, what is the use? What is the what is the benefit the society is going to accrue by uh, storing these uh, genetic resources? So we have the you know calculation estimated annual markets for genetic resources in the form of pharmaceutical. Uh, if you take uh, pharmaceutical, a uh, lower estimate is seventy five billion US dollars, and the uh, uh, it can go up to 150 uh, million US dollars. Then botanical medicine also have a very large market and uh, major crops, horticultural crops, then crop protection, biotechnology. So uh, total estimation is uh, five, uh, 500 uh, US billion dollars and uh, uh, it can go up to 800 uh, uh, million billion US dollars. So uh, a large uh, uh, market is there, and this is as per the calculation of Tim Kate and Laird in 1999. Uh, and as I was mentioning, uh, one technique or one method may not sufficient enough to conserve the entire genetic diversity of a given species. So what we do is uh, uh, two or more strategies. Uh, uh, we adopt, and uh, this had led to the adoption of more holistic approach of, uh, to the conservation, and the formulation and overall conservation strategy should apply a combination of uh, uh, different techniques available, including uh, in situ, ex situ techniques, where the different methodologies methodologies complement each other. So, in short, uh, to have maximum genetic diversity uh, to be conserved for a given species we should adopt more than one technique. And if this in C2 and XC2 together, that will really help. But in some cases, it's not possible. So we go for a, a more than one XC2 conservation strategy. So uh, with that, we can make it sure that the maximum genetic diversity for a given species is uh, conserved. I, now, uh, uh, if you uh, go into the details of the complementary conservation in this slide, it is given. See, we have uh, the hypothetical representation of, uh, of the proportions of the gene pool conserved using seven different conservation strategies uh, for uh, different crops. Uh, we have taken uh, 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 root or tuber cross forest species. Uh, and uh, uh, seven different uh, conservation strategies. See, for example, seed storage, field gene bank, in vitro, pollen, DNA, genetic or on farm conservation. And you see the uh, uh, the first one. You see, uh, see by using seed storage, you can conserve uh, uh, very good uh, genetic diversity. Then uh, next is uh, uh, field gene bank. And for example, if you take a root or tuber crop, uh, uh, field gene bank is the best, and uh, see, with the seed you can conserve very less uh, uh, diversity than uh, in vitro. Uh, also, a possible uh, solution then we, you can have the uh, to a certain extent you can have the pollen storage. Then, uh, of course, the latest the DNA storage, then genetic around farm. Then for forest species, if you take uh, 
the best one is genetic reserve you can see you know large uh, chunk of the diversity you can conserve in the form of a genetic reserve and the other uh, uh, <coughs> techniques are uh, less uh, important for uh, for species so here uh, it's very clear uh, you have to to have uh, maximum genetic diversity to be conserved for a given species you should go for different conservation strategies and uh, it should be complementary and will help to conserve the maximum genetic diversity for a given species and depending on the crop you should select the method of uh, conservation and you should go for more than one method to get maximum genetic diversity conserved and uh, uh, i was mentioning about the horticulture species uh, how it can be conserved see there was a project uh, funded by unep jeff uh, united nations environment program global environmental facility and it was administered by the biocity international and uh, icr was icr ihrs involved in uh, this project and uh, uh, there was uh, uh, three four crops like citrus uh, mango uh, uh then uh, other two crops was also taken for the conservation of uh, conservation and uh, what they did is for uh, 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 because it was a very successful project and what they did i would just uh, mention in uh, mention in this slide uh, for mango they have selected 83 custodian farmers and initially they identified the site in fact uh, the uh, project uh, to select the site uh, site they took uh, two years and with that uh, they could collect the information on the custodian farmers and uh, who who is having maximum diversity conserved in the field and they uh, documented this and uh, uh, 180 uh, take uh, uh, ssg was established and uh, 53 nurseries and uh, uh, 27 fruit catalogs garcinia mango and citrus they were taken uh, in this uh, for uh, india and uh, uh, various icr institute was involved and uh, uh, it was a very successful project and uh, uh, they could uh, identify the customers and see the way to do the in situ conservation in fruit crops as a model i proposed this and uh, it was very successful and it was a five year project uh, and uh, the custodian farmers uh, they should be recognized and they are the people who are going to do the conservation and uh, incentives to be given for uh, the conservation of the uh, tree species and uh, uh, this is how you know future conservation is possible for the uh, perennial crops especially fruit crops and uh, uh you know there should be given incentives in fact for doing conservation the farmers are not getting any incentives that is why they go for the cat crops and uh, they will uh, uh, leave these uh, crops and they go for the uh, crops which are uh, very remunerative too. in that process we lose uh, many crops and to prevent that uh, this model is a, a very successful model now, uh, before going to the Indian scenario, I'll just uh, show you the what is the uh, world scenario of conservation of uh, genetic resources, especially in the case of uh, horticultural genetic resources. And when coming to this uh, successful conservation uh, of uh, conservation of genetic resources in the gene banks, we have to see the CGI or this consultative groups and International Agricultural Research Institute. There are uh, 11 centers and they are having uh, 7 lakh samples of crop for agri uh, agroforestry genetic resources. And these are the institutes uh, having uh, very good gene banks at international standards established at their centers. And uh, in India, we have the ICRISAT. Uh, is part of it and they uh, conserve the uh, genetic resources related to the semi-arid tropics. And uh, here in this slide, uh, in this map, you can see where are these uh, gene banks located. And for rice, we have this International Rice Research Institute. And uh, for horticultural crops, some of these uh, institutes are working on horticultural crops. And in the coming slides, I will show you which are the institutes uh, taking up the uh, 
conservation of horticultural genetic resources. Here you can see the uh, in this gene banks so how many collections are there. For example, the uh, CIT is having cassava and bean. Uh, these are the horticulture uh, crops. Then uh, CIP is having that is uh, International Potato Center located in Lima, uh, Peru. They have the tubers, uh, sweet potato and potato. Then uh, I, uh, Ikada is having faba bean, forages and lentil and chickpea. Then the uh, Ikrisat, mostly they uh, con uh, conserve the chickpea, groundnut, pearl millet, pig genti, sorghum and minor millets. Then IATA, of course, they are having the cassava, cowpea, wild vigna and yam. Then the forages, the uh, ILRA, they are conserved. Then the IPGRA, they are uh, uh, <clears throat> Musa, they have taken up, and as I mentioned, their entire collection is in the form of in vitro. Then, of course, it is exclusively for rice, and uh, other institutes are not concerned with the horticultural crops. Now, uh, with this uh, scenario, I will uh, tell you something what we have done at the Institute of Horticultural Research. I have been uh, working at the Indian Institute of Horticulture Research for the last 31 years. So I would like to share uh, my experience with the conservation of horticultural genetic resources. So what we do in this uh, genetic resource activities, we do the exploration and collection uh, for different uh, crops at different parts of India. We have not gone outside uh, India. Uh, and uh, as uh, you know India is having uh, four uh, different uh, hotspots of biodiversity and uh, where we are, uh, that is one of the hottest hotspots, the uh, <clears throat> Western Ghats. And uh, uh, we are having the biggest pollen crab in the world. I will tell you more about that in the coming slides. Then one uh, case study I will be sharing with you in vitro that is nothapoditis pneumonia and it is a medicinal uh, plant which are becoming uh, endangered. Then we establish a field gene bank for rare and uh, certain medicinal plants and uh, uh, latest uh, we did a, a study uh, Madhika insignis how to conserve it's a critically endangered species uh, as mentioned uh, in the uh, <coughs> data book of uh, International Union for uh, Conservation of Nature, it is mentioned extinct, and we could uh, uh, revive this species uh, using the uh, biotechnological uh, tools. I will be telling more about the slides. Now, uh, now I'll just uh, uh, share some of our uh, exploration, uh, uh, the uh, natural exploration to different uh, places of. Uh, uh, South India and uh, other places, and you can see where to look for the collection. See, normally you will not get uh, collections from the market or other. If you want to go for the land races, we have to meet the farmers and the other tribes. You can see the uh, this we have collected from the Rolik tribes. It is in uh, North Canara of uh, Karnataka, and uh, when we went there, the entire. Uh, you know, children, they came to see our vehicle. And in fact, the Gauli tribes were not very, uh, you know, they are not that, uh, ready to share resources. And in some of them were running when we saw our vehicle because they were seeing these people are going to come to collect some uh, tax or something like that. So they were not at all friendly. And uh, uh, another very important issue which I would like to share with you is uh, there is one tribe called uh, the uh, <clears throat> in the uh, Bilki village of Elapur district. They are called the Siddhi tribes. In fact, these people, they came along with the uh, Portuguese 500 years ago, and the Portuguese left us, and uh, these people remained there in the Elapur district of uh, uh, <coughs> North Canra, and they were very friendly, and uh, they are cultivating a lot of uh, horticultural crops, and they shared uh, information and material with us, and uh, uh, they're very friendly, and you can see their faces uh, smiling. Then uh, uh, in uh, uh, <coughs> Shimoga district, uh, we could collect a jow, which, is, uh, which was weighing almost uh, 500 to 750 grams. And you can see the farmer who is cultivating uh, this uh, brinjal. It is very 
tasty and uh, it is cultivated in asan acre land and uh, you can see on the right uh, right side you can see how the farmers conserve the seeds this is the traditional way of conserving the seeds by the farmers and in amaran see amaran is getting lot of uh, importance now for the you know uh, eye related issue vitamin a problem can be solved we could collect uh, from kanada fortify accessions belong to five uh, uh, different species all uh, species are uh, you know you can there are some of them are uh, leafy vegetables some of them are grain uh yielding one and uh, a total of 45 accessions we could uh, collect from different uh, places of karnataka then uh, uh, our explore maharashtra you can see the here the ratnagiri district in a small patch of land they were cultivating the cowpea and brinjal and it's a, uh, it's a traditional varieties uh, land races and they are fetching a, a high price for this uh, crop because it is very tasty and uh, you know people like it then again uh, darwad we could do a exploration exclusive for brinjal as uh, brinjal you know we have 3000 varieties in india and these are the uh, local varieties or uh, the land races you can see here the, some of them betigere local kudichi local lokur local and malapur local and some of them are gis geographically indicated and this will find only in these places and they are having a particular taste and uh, color and size and uh, people like it and as far as brinjal is concerned different uh, places in india are having different uh, you know liking you cannot have a uh, common uh, variety for india it is uh, highly localized and uh, for the beans we did an exploration in up this takaman district of uh, tamil nadu there from there we could collect uh, 38 uh, varieties of uh, um, french beans and uh, as you know french beans were introduced by europeans when they came here and uh, the people uh, started cultivating it and uh, you can see the availability in uh, this uh, crop and uh, another one another exploration we did uh, uh, in western ghats for the wild relatives and uh, the vegetable crops here you can see my friend uh, dr joseph john he is the author of this species momordica sahyadrika new species it is a wild relative of momordica and you can see uh, other uh, you know small tomato and local cucumis and uh, in dashin kannada it is uh, very interesting you know they have a community seed bank uh, if you go with uh, your seeds there you can exchange the seeds and uh, uh, you know uh, it is a very good concept and this way only the farmers can uh, grow their uh, and conserve the species and the person on the top is manapa karkeri award winning uh, uh, farmer from uh, dashin kannada he has cultivated lot of crops um, in his uh, farm land now uh, with that uh, uh, <clears throat> now i would like to share my experience with the pollen crop preservation you may ask this question why to conserve uh, pollen it conserve the nuclear genetic diversity at haploid stage and as you know uh, pollen is highly compact occupies less uh, space in biological containers and uh, least quarantine problems and it facilitates a global exchange of nuclear genetic diversity in the form of uh, uh, pollen then why this uh, cryogenic technology is applied for uh, conservation uh, see the cryogenic technology is a live conservation of biological materials ultra low temperature at liquid nitrogen and it ensures uh, safe and cost effective long term conservation of plant genetic resources and uh, it improves the safety standards of conservation and need for uh, but uh, a well defined protocol is uh, required for different gene pool to be conserved in liquid nitrogen and uh, this is the only method by which you can conserve material long term ex situ and no other by using no other method you cannot conserve material uh, for long term then you may ask this question what are the advantages why we should conserve uh, pollen 
See, the advantages are uh, many, and some of them are mentioned here. Uh, you can have the intercrossing of asynchronously flowering genotypes, then perpetuation of male sterile populations, improve breeding efficiency, avoid uh, growing male uh, parents every season, and you can undertake multi-location breeding, and most of the seed companies are there now doing the multi-location breeding, and of course, for hybrid seed production, this can be used very effectively. And the methodology we developed is very simple. Uh, you can uh, follow that uh, without much problem. And uh, we, what we do is uh, we collect the pollen and assess the viability uh, using different methods. We have developed the uh, technique for assessing the viability. Then we pack these uh, po uh, uh, pollen in a laminated aluminum pouch uh, and we transfer the pollen into uh, gelatin capsules, then by direct plunging, we do the conservation and you can keep it for, uh, you know, one day or two days or long term in the liquid nitrogen. Then, of course, if you want uh, to use that pollen, we do the thawing, taking out from the liquid nitrogen. And when again, they, we do the uh, <clears throat> viability assessment and, of course, fertility assessment is the final uh, uh, <clears throat> way to show that is pollen viable and the ultimate test is the uh, fruit and seed set by using this uh, stored pollen. Uh, normally for the collection, we do the uh, uh, pre-bagging, then we bring the pollen, uh, we bring the flowers and do, uh, extract the pollen by tapping it and the pollen should be free from other debris, then we do the bulking. And of course, in vitro germination, normally we do by hanging drop technique by using uh, 6 to 25% of sucrose uh, and using Brubaker salt, uh, salt. This Brubaker salt can uh, potassium nitrate, magnesium sulfate, and uh, boric acid. And we incubate the uh, slides uh, uh, from 4 hours to 18 hours. In the case of uh, citrus, we have to uh, incubate for 18 hours. For other pollen, like tomato, brinjal, and that too, for uh, hours you get the germination. Then we uh, stain the slide using Alexander stain, and uh, you can estimate the germination profiles using a, a microscope. And under the microscope, we normally see some uh, 10 uh, <coughs> views, and uh, we uh, we calculate the, uh, we estimate the germination profile of the Pollen. Then uh, you can see on the right side how we go for the packing of pollen. See, normally after uh, the viability assessment, we put the pollen in this uh, gelatin capsule, which is available in pharmaceutical companies. And these gelatin capsules are put in, in laminated aluminum pouches. This uh, aluminum pouches is sealed tightly on all the slides, all the sides, and then we directly plunge into the liquid nitrogen for the correct solution. And you can re retain this uh, pollen in liquid nitrogen for days, months, and years. And uh, ultimate uh, test is for, uh, for the pollen, whether it is viable or not, is the fruit set and seed set. And uh, 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 number of seeds per uh, fruit. So now, uh, uh, in a nutshell, uh, for the last, uh, we started this in uh, 1983. That is, uh, we successfully completed uh, uh, 38 years, and uh, now we have developed protocol for 100 species belonging to 50 families and uh, successfully stored for uh, 37 years. And uh, maximum period we tested was 26 years for uh, tomato. And uh, I can uh, uh, <clears throat> say that, uh, you know, with the confidence, these techniques for uh, collection, viability, and fertility assessment optimized for uh, 100 species mostly belonging to these. Uh, horticultural crops. And what we did is, uh, you know, from uh, 2016 onwards, we were uh, uh, transferring this technology for hybrid seed, seed uh, production. You can see here the Vienna seeds, the Indo-American hybrid seeds, the Rasi seeds, then uh, the seed works, and latest was the Nanhams. The five seed companies who have taken this technology for hybrid seed production in vegetables from us, and they are successfully using this technique for uh, producing hybrids in these uh, uh, vegetable crops. And uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm very proud to say that this is this uh, crab bank pollen crab bank featured in the Limca Book of Records in. Uh, 
uh, 2001 uh, uh, being the largest uh, foreign bank in the world. And uh, uh, at present, you can see this is the condition of our Karai Bank. We have uh, the pollen Karai preserved in this uh, Karai containers. And they, these two are from the, uh, it was uh, imported from US. And you can see these are all Indian containers. Then this is our uh, uh, seed bank, uh, which we are uh, conserving the seeds of the horticulture crops, mainly vegetables. And this is the in vitro bank. And now uh, coming to the other form of conservation, we could establish a field gene bank for uh, RET medicinal plants, these uh, rare, endangered, and threatened medicinal plants. In fact, we had a network project from National Medicinal Plant Board, uh, and 10 centers were involved in the collection, exploration, collection, and conservation of 32 rare, endangered, threatened plants. And uh, we could establish a very good field gene bank uh, consisting the species and uh, uh, you, uh, I will show you some of the uh, <clears throat> photos. You can see the, you know, the different views of the uh, gene bank. This gene bank, field gene bank, we maintain uh, organically. We are not uh, spraying any chemicals and uh, uh, we are not using fertilizers for uh, growing these plants. It is all organically grown. And uh, you, even the hedge plants and life and all are uh, medicinal and we are using the even the, uh, you know, uh, boundary wall for uh, conservation. Then uh, we did the chemical profiling of uh, this uh, species uh, to find the chemical diversity and uh, it would be worthwhile to generate valuable information on chemical diversity. And it also unraveled the extent of chemical diversity and superior collection and development of HPLC methods. This was in short, the, uh, you know, why we did the chemical profiling. And you can see the chemical profiling profiles of uh, different species in this uh, slide. Uh, for uh, five, six species, we did this uh, chemical profiling. Then we did the molecular profiling also. We wanted to know the what is the diversity available in these species. So for that, we uh, did the molecular profiling also. And you can see the, you know, using ISSR markers, we did it for uh, Acorus calamus and Celastus paniculatus, Alpinia calcreta, and the Orosalem indicum, and uh, published very good papers in the, you know, Indian Journal of uh, Biotechnology for uh, all these species, and it's available. And we had a stream of visitors from all over India. And you can see here Dr. Pushpama, then he was the former director of JNTPGRI and National Botanical Research Institute. And you can see the Dr. Sanjapa was a former director of BSI. You know, we used to get a lot of visitors before the COVID period. And a lot of students used to visit their first time seeing this uh, type of plants in the live conditions. Now, uh, I would like to share uh, our experience in uh, conserving the Nothapoditis pneumonia, as I mentioned. It is an endangered medicinal plant, certain medicinal plants available on the Western Ghats. We had one project supported by the National Medicinal Plan for this uh, species. And we developed the in vitro uh, system for this plant. In fact, it was very difficult to develop an in vitro system. In fact, uh, one of my students took uh, six months to establish in vitro system uh, for this uh, uh, plant species. And uh, how we could establish we tried uh, leaf, we tried the uh, shoot, we tried all the parts and uh, only the seed, uh, uh, you know, the embryonic axis of the seed was uh, responding. Rest, rest of the uh, <coughs> plant parts never responded in vitro. And uh, you see, uh, we developed the in vitro system using the embryonic axis. And uh, uh, once we could establish uh, the in vitro system, uh, we, uh, went for uh, two, uh, you know, one is a somatic embryogenesis and another is a direct uh, uh, regeneration. So you can see the, uh, you know, development of the embryogenesis uh, in this uh, species, three week incubation and uh, small spherical globular structures uh, started coming out. And uh, one more thing important uh, thing here is uh, without thiazuron, 
50 years, you will not get any response in vitro for uh, this uh, species. So that is also very important. And uh, you see, we got almost uh, 70 numbers of somatic embryos, and you can see the emergence of plants from the somatic embryos, and you can see the uh, fully developed plant left, uh, from the somatic embryos. And uh, uh, the other uh, uh, strategy was to induce multiple shoots. You can see the uh, you know multiple shoots uh, from the cultures, and uh, the small tips uh, shoots were initiated on TDZ media. Uh, but TDZ was uh, not good for the uh, you know development of the plantlets, and later on we uh, changed the media when we could get the plantlets. Then uh, uh, you have you have to induce a root. For that we used uh, you know IBA one mg per liter. Then we could get the uh, roots for this uh, species. Then uh, we did the in vitro conservation also using low light and uh, uh, temperature, and uh, we can keep it for six month uh, period without any subculture. Then this is a hardening procedure. We followed this uh, species. And you can see the uh, establishment of plants, extra victim that is outside the uh, in vitro uh, conditions. Uh, and we established, we could establish this plant uh, outside the in vitro system. Now, uh, uh, I would like to share our experience with the conservation of Madhuka insignis. We used to call it as back from the brink. Uh, using the biotechnological approaches uh, uh, for the integrated conservation of uh, Madhuka insignis. Madhuka insignis, as I told you, if you see the red data book of uh, IUCN, there it mentioned extinct. And it was rediscovered after 120 years by a group of scientists under the leadership of Dr. Gawal Krishna Bhatt in uh, Udupi district of Karnataka. And uh, to uh, do this, we uh, first met Dr. Babal Krishna Bhatt and asked his help to locate the original population of this plant. And uh, he was very successful. Uh, he was very helpful uh, in that uh, mission and he accompanied us to uh, that place. Uh, uh, see, first question we asked is what is the current status of Madhuka insignis? And as I mentioned, it was rediscovered after 120 years. Then uh, using this uh, RGIS, we prepared a distribution and prediction map uh, for the species. Here you can see the, uh, you know, its populations are dwindling and uh, we have only very few plants, uh, 80, 18 plants in nature. And you can see the, uh, you know, uh, where are these uh, species located in this map. And uh, uh, we did, uh, you know, uh, using this uh, uh, software, we could predict the uh, loca more location of the species. See, for example, uh, in some of the places we could locate uh, some three places. We, these are the three spaces we could uh, locate for the first time. Though the number of individuals are very less, this first time we reported and we published this information also. Then another thing we did is uh, we uh, made a prediction map of Madhuka insignis and uh, under the changing climate scenario, because as I mentioned, climate change is affecting the species in a large way. You can see in uh, uh, 2020, what is the status of the species and 2040, uh, you can see there is change then 2060 and 2080. So uh, this software you can use for, uh, you know, one is uh, to locate the new species and it can also help in conserve the species uh, and uh, what is going to happen in the coming years also can be predicted. The next question we asked is, are the collected specimens are authentic or not? Because we don't have much information on the botanical identity of species because as I told you, it was rediscovered after 120 years. So we, uh, what we did is we approached Dr. Bhatt. Uh, whenever we collect the material, we used to go to him and uh, uh, seek his opinion whether it is belongs to the species or not. And you can see here, uh, you know, uh, one problem is uh, it is quite related to, you know, we have five species of Madhuka 
and it is quite uh, similar to maduka neerifolia so how to establish this uh, you know identity of the species so what we did is uh, 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 we developed a molecular marker exclusively to identify this uh, species specific scar marker we developed for uh, maduka engine so here uh, comes the importance of biotechnology as uh, some of you are mentioning in your introductory remarks that uh, you know how biotechnology can uh, we use for uh, you know the benefit of the society so what we did is uh, we developed a scar marker exclusively to identify the species even at the seedling stage so this is how we developed the marker first we did the rapd uh, 20 primers we used and uh, uh, a scar marker derived from rapd amplification you can see the different stages here next question how uh, Uh, our aim is to conserve the species see how we can conserve the species what is the strategy you should follow now all of you are clear from my previous slides uh, you know different strategies available what are the strategies we can use for this species and uh, you see first is the uh, development of see uh, first uh, we collected the seeds and then uh, we have to propagate the species what we did is we collected the soil from the uh, root Uh, uh of this uh, uh plant because these are all uh, three species and we collected the uh soil and uh, from the soil we uh, could isolate a microbial consortium containing trichoderma penicillium and aspergillus species and we mix the soil and uh, this and uh, uh, this Uh, microbial consortium really helped to establish the seedlings in fact uh, germination is not a problem establishment of the seedling is a problem for the, that we uh, developed the microbial uh, this thing you can see here the you know microbial treatment really helped to establish this uh, plant species and you can see here the uh, you know uh, species growth if you use the microbial consortium is much better than compared to the uh <clears throat> control and uh, we developed large number of seedlings and you can see uh, you know we developed the nursery at ihr then uh, what we did is by using this uh, seedlings we re we wanted to reestablish the population in their natural niche habitat and we took the help of the karnataka forest department in fact they were very helpful and they extended our help for uh, you know re establishment of the species in the natural conditions and this is the uh, one of the site where we could uh, augment the species site in uh, osmet mangalore then uh, uh, in kidu in three places we could uh, plant these uh, seedlings uh, to uh, you know uh, and uh, uh, another place where we have this plant is uh, pilikula nisarga dama near mangalore and uh, at ih our indonesia fortical cell reserve also we established uh, a few plants and it is growing well and you can see the this was taken one year back and now it is grown and uh, it is established well because this is a riparian species so uh, it needs uh, water body is near but we could establish well and it is growing well Okay, now this is a population structure you can see in nature only 21 plants are available for this species any time it will become extinct if you if we don't take actions to conserve this species and you can see the uh, uh, you know uh, over a period of time you can see you know there is a decrease in plants in the uh, natural populations and uh, what are the reasons for uh, this plant becoming uh, rare and uh, you know uh, uh, threatened see excessive uh, sand mining is one of the main reason then uh, fragmentation of the uh, fragmentation then uh, uh, again uh, you know the loss of uh, inflows and damage due to the fruit wars so in short uh, uh, what are the studies we did uh, you know mainly using the biotechnological tools we did the population study as i mentioned using this uh, uh, software then first time we uh, isolation characterization and summation of plant growth promoting consortia we developed then uh, development of the scar markers and we submitted the gene sequence to the public domain that is ncbi 
then chemical profiling and uh, preliminary study showing uh, uh, the multi insignificant candidate for uh, treatment of uh, against cancer those things i am not presented because uh, i thought uh, the <clears throat> studies related to conservation is more relevant here then uh, we uh, even uh, uh, updated the iuc in status and the providing road map for the future conservation and defining the exciting research areas explored in the future uh, so this uh, small step in help to conserve this critically endangered species and uh, these studies helped us to have a lot of publication you can see the publications uh, uh, in these species which uh, most of them are first time then uh, uh, with that uh, uh, now we go uh, to the global holding of the commodity crops uh, later to the uh, horticultural crops here you can see the root tubers uh, vegetables nuts and berries then the medicinal uh, this is from the fao report though it is uh, um uh, in 2014 the trend is, is the same now also uh, you can see here uh, we have more in cereals and food legume because they are the staple crops then uh, 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 coming to the indian uh, uh, accessions concern i mean our national gene bank you can see here uh, our national gene bank located at national bureau of land genetic resources pusa new delhi you can see the uh, uh, can, can, uh, the accessions concern in horticultural crops in this slide but still compared to the cereals and other uh, food crops the collections in uh, horticultural crops are uh, less because of various reasons like most of them are not seed propagated so we should develop a protocol exclusively for that and this is the uh, conservation uh, using the uh, <coughs> Uh, using crop preservation you can see here uh, you know uh, ndp here is in the fourth trend of conservation using uh, crop preservation uh, this in different uh, countries uh, how many uh, accessions are available for horticultural crops in a nutshell uh, it is shown here so now uh, now as i was mentioning this has got uh, livelihood and nutrition security uh we should be able to use this conserve uh, uh, material see main driving force behind the first conservation is utilization there is no doubt about as uh, uh, renowned agricultural scientist dr m swaminathan was uh, mentioning once that uh, uh, conservation without uh, action is only conversation so crop crop uh, it should be used for crop improvement then adaptation and sustainability needs for farming community collecting and conservation of horticulture as main second progress in the uh, you know uh, in the last few years but uh, a long way to go and effective use of them is still waiting and uh, some of the constraints for the use is uh, see there is uh, no real consideration benefits for the poor farmers we all the stakeholders are never involved in the conservation and use we neglect the far, uh, farming community and decisions on conservation is based on benefit to the farmers it should be based benefit to the farmers and fencing of the uh, I, as i was mentioning about the crop uh, wild relatives are very important because uh, to overcome the uh, biotic and abiotic stress crop wild relatives are the only way and the future value may diminish as evolutionary potential as i mentioned uh, this concern uh, the resources uh, you know it is without uh, the evolution it may not able to survive in the a uh, scenario of climate change and uh, move part of them to exit to conserve collections for utilization we should always able to utilize this uh, material conserve in different gene banks and uh, most of the gene banks yet characterize and evaluate accessions that they conserve this is a one a very important issue most of the collections are uh, uh, only in the form of seeds and these are all not characterized in fact if you go to a ready made shop you can take the uh, you know uh, cloth which you want with the, your uh, preference but that is not possible in the case of uh, gene bank because most of these collections are not characterized because the characterization involves lot of activities and lot of money is required and uh, even though some activities are the incomplete characterization and evaluation is only uh, done then limited access trade specific value evaluation should be done and highly limited characterization evaluation on the like horticulture species and of course for horticulture species is much more uh, difficult and much more important 
but the uh, uh, characterization uh, only in infancy in most of crops and uh, uh, now we are looking for the uh, trait specific germblasm in different crops and that is not available with the gene bank so the uh, institutes like ihr is trying to have the characterization and we are uh, uh going to have the uh, characterized uh, uh, accession for in most of the crops uh, and a little research on cost effective long term conservation to uh, uh, for most of the species uh, see we are not using the modern scientific methods and the curators are uh, rarely involved in research on genetics and other aspects and increase research on issues arising from population genetics and policy studies and uh, new problems in conservation and crop production and use of geographical and spatial information as i was mentioning that should be uh, used more appropriately and increase analysis of uh, use of georeference data from the gene banks also uh, very important for uh, increasing the use of these uh, genetic resources and uh, lack of breeding efforts and commercial varieties of underutilized see for example uh, most of the uh, horticulture crops are orphan crops or underutilized crops and uh, we should integrate conservation with the use and enhance studies on uh, uh, diversification lack of refined strategies then another uh, group of crops like medicinal and aromatic crop, uh, uh, plants there is my, uh, very less information is available but now it is coming in the limelight and uh, need strategies to conserve at the same time minimize the uh, over exploitation of naturally occurring resources and uh, restoration of it may, may be required as i was showing we could establish uh, re restore the species in the wild so uh, such activities are very important and uh, uh, to conclude uh, you know the issues involved uh, uh, in the genetic resource conservation of horticultural crops i will just uh, you know few of the points i have summarized here Uh, one issue is how to get germblasm from other countries now uh, as you know the uh, cbd has changed the uh, <clears throat> scenario or the landscape of uh, genetic resource uh, ownership as per the con con uh, convention on biodiversity now the genetic resource belonging to the country of origin and uh, uh, once uh, that came into being countries uh, stopped uh, sharing the germblasm for different crops and now only usda and other uh, cgir institutes are ready to share the germblasm see other countries are uh, stopped sharing the germblasm so the uh, if we want uh, you know lychee from uh, uh, china is having very good lychee uh, species and uh, china is not ready to share and uh, similarly the other countries are also uh, not ready to share their genetic resources because they have the ownership and uh, they want to make best use of it and cultivation of exotic crops are more remunerative see for example now dragon fruit and kiwi fruit started uh, 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 farmers started cultivating these uh, crops and uh, they are uh, very remunerative in fact uh, my uh, fellow scientist uh, dr ukarna karan was telling if you cultivate dragon fruit in one acre you get uh, 6 lakh 6 lakh rupees per year it's a very good uh, remunerative crop and uh, people started start cultivating those crops and the use of germblasm stored in gene banks as i mentioned not characterized so we should have a uh, <clears throat> in bar footing we should do the characterization of this uh, germblasm then use of crop while relatives to deal with the abiotic and biotic stress you no know, need to stress then uh, Uh, we have this uh, national agri uh, national active germblasm site for the conservation of uh, vegetatively propagated crops but there is no funding for uh, uh, this uh, uh, facilities then abs abs stand for access and benefit sharing now uh, the uh, as per the uh, protocol if we wanted to get the, the germblasm shared we should uh, have the uh, protocol of uh, abs that is access and benefit sharing any benefit accrued accrued from the uh, germblasm we should share with the original uh, owner of uh, the germblasm see that is also not followed but uh, now it is mandatory as per the biodiversity law of india uh, any material we are going to use uh, belongs to somebody else we should able to share the benefit 
accrued out of uh, making that uh, gem blossom for uh, any breeding activities. Now, uh, I would like to share, you know, those who wanted to know more about uh, my uh, work. And uh, uh, this is uh, one uh, <clears throat> volume which we published for uh, Springer. Uh, uh, you can see here the conservation and utilization of horticultural gen genetic resources, along with Dr. Ramnath Rao edited this volume. All the information related to the different uh, horticultural crops are compiled in this volume. Another one is exclusively for the conservation and utilization of threatened medicine plants also, which is published by the Springer. And uh, uh, this is my uh, <coughs> Google Scholar. Uh, I am uh, going to touch uh, 1,000 citations for my uh, publications. And uh, uh, you can get information from uh, the Google Scholar also. So uh, as I was mentioning in pre, uh, previously, see, seventy-five percent of the world poor are rural, and most are most of them are involved in farming. And uh, in the twenty-first century, agriculture remains fundamental for poverty reduction, economic growth, and environmental sustainability. And our national food security depends on our ability to uh, conserve all our biological wealth. And uh, finally, I would like to thank you, Genomia, for Plant Genomia, for giving this opportunity. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed uh, sharing the information with you. Thank you. Back. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, yeah. It was very interesting with all the good quality photographs uh, of field, gene banks, uh, and uh, laboratories and everything. It was really interesting and fascinating to see all of them. And it was a very knowledgeable session for everyone. And people are continuously commenting in the comment box uh, that uh, it was so informative and uh, it is a great uh, Thank you. all knowledgeable slides. Uh, so there are many questions actually in the chat box. So due to the time constraint, I could not put all the questions. So I will ask few of them. Uh, would you like to take them, sir? Yeah, yeah. yeah. With a pleasure. Yeah. So Dr. Mahesh is asking, can you throw some light on novel pre-breeding approaches in conservation of horticultural crops? Yeah, it's a uh, good question. Uh, Sir, uh, before continuing the question, uh, it's better that you can uh, just uh, stop sh screen share so that yeah, you are clearly yeah, yeah. seen. Yeah. It's a good question. See, without the uh, pre-breeding activities, uh, you cannot uh, get the uh, you know resistant varieties. As I was mentioning, uh, now we are in the process of uh, uh, integrating genes from the crop bioelectives. See, and the crop bioelectives are uh, you know the pool of genes which uh, uh, having resistance to the abiotic and abiotic stress. And uh, in horticulture crops at uh, our institutes, uh, we are <clears throat> uh, in most of the, uh, see in uh, tomato, we have, uh, we, we are uh, doing this. And in uh, chilies, we have developed a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, resistant varieties. And in uh, other uh, horticulture crops, see, for example, in uh, uh, <clears throat> watermelon, in uh, uh, the other melons and uh, in most of the articles these activities are going on uh, though i mentioned uh, you know the importance of uh, well relatives in uh, uh, in tomato and in chilies and in watermelon uh, the use of these well relatives are very prominent and it yielded very good results uh, in other crops, see the problem with the breeders are they are looking for quick fix solutions. They want to release a variety in one or two years of effort. I'm not blaming them because if you are look, you you have to look for your uh, you know career growth also. In that process, uh, you know uh, if you want to use these violatives, uh, it will take uh, five to ten years to integrate the. Uh, <clears throat> 
uh, resistance to the cultivated uh, uh, varieties so uh, people are uh, you know uh, <clears throat> people are not able to uh, allot that much time for uh, this work so th that is uh, one problem but in uh, most of the crops uh, we are able to uh, do this and the pre breeding lines are available and uh, uh, you know, uh, in uh, coming years, we will have uh, resistant varieties for most of the uh, crops. Okay, sir. Uh, then the next question is, Dr. Dwarka is asking, can we do cryotechnology other than the liquid nitrogen? And what are the recent approaches in those? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, see, any conservation technology it should meet the, uh, one is the security. See, we can use uh, uh, liquid oxygen, but it is inflammable. Liquid hydrogen, that is also inflammable. But the, pro the advantage with the liquid nitrogen, it is, it is meeting all the safety standards. You, even if you uh, inhale it, nothing is going to happen. Other, uh, uh, <clears throat> other gases are, uh, you know, one is inflammable, another is, uh, you know, toxic. So you cannot uh, use other gases other than uh, liquid nitrogen. And liquid nitrogen, the another advantage is it's available plenty in nature. That is 78% of the atmosphere is filled with uh, nitrogen gas. You should have only a method to convert this uh, gas into liquid. So with uh, pressure, you can do that. And uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the cost also very less. We, in fact, we get... Uh, uh, liquid nitrogen for a cost of uh, 35 rupees per uh, liter. Yeah. In fact, uh, before the COVID, it was 12 rupees. But now, after the COVID, the uh, prices have gone up and now it is uh, fetching. And you can get only for 35 rupees. That also for uh, bulk purchase. So the main reason is, uh, you know, it, it should be met with uh, some safety standards. Otherwise, you cannot uh, use it. Uh, so the uh, uh, use of other gases are not permitted for uh, due to security reasons. Okay, sir. Thank you. And coming to the next one, uh, like how these technologies will help in participated plant breeding? It was asked by Dr. S. K. Das. Yeah, uh, that is also a good question. I was mentioning about uh, the uh, UNEP JEP project on uh, tropical fruits. In fact, uh, uh, that is a participatory way of uh, conservation. See, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we are not considering all the stakeholders while conserving the species. Scientists feel that, uh, you know, he know everything. So he use some method and can, uh, try to conserve the species. But that is not going to help nowadays because, uh, you know, we don't know the field condition. So the uh, uh, best way is, uh, you know, along with the scientists, all the stakeholders should be uh, involved in the conservation and use of genetic resources. Uh, and now uh, we propose a project uh, uh, to, you know, in fact, it was uh, the principal scientific advisor to the prime minister, Dr. K. Vijayarakhavan. It is his, uh, we approached him and uh, the project is in the pipeline that is National Biodiversity Mission. And there this, uh, you know, conservation we propose uh, uh, using participatory method. And uh, uh, participatory method of conservation will yield the participatory way of breeding and participatory, uh, you know, everything will be participatory and all the stakeholders will be involved. And that is the best way. And in future, uh, you know, that is the only way we can uh, save the, uh, one is to save the biodiversity, second to uh, have the use of the uh, saved biodiversity. Otherwise the use also, you know, though we have a, a lot of uh, material stored in the gene bank, the use is not uh, as much uh, we, uh, uh, you know, we envisaged. The use is uh, less because of uh, various reasons. Mainly, you know, the many people are not uh, aware that uh, that material is available. And as I mentioned, these materials are not characterized. Okay, sir. Thank you for the clarification. And the next question is by Prem Tak. He is asking that how to overcome the fundamental problems with the effective conservation of genetic diversity of a given species that is spread across the national borders. Yeah, that is a, a good question. Uh, the 
You see, uh, some of the species are, uh, in fact, species are not having the political boundaries. Species are only, uh, you know, based on the niche, based on the, you know, distribution pattern, based on mainly uh, agroecological conditions. So to uh, go for such a conservation, uh, see, one is the, Uh, one is we should have uh, uh, integrated approach and uh, involving all the con and uh, the conservation strategies uh, practiced by the biodiversity international see for example this uh, example i was telling you the uh, unep jeff project is uh, uh, a, uh, an example for that and there the you know uh, in uh, south asia india sri lanka malaysia uh, uh, all involved in uh, conservation of the uh, species. So the Biodiversity International, uh, they, they envisage the conservation of species uh, based on the distribution of the species. So uh, it's a very good question. And uh, now we should have such strategy uh, to cutting across, uh, across all the political boundaries. Then only we can conserve the species. But uh, such projects are uh, uh, very less uh, but Biodiversity International, they try to have such projects. Okay. It may be due to the policy issues. Exactly. Maybe. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so my next question is, uh, how you are take, uh, tackling the field gene bank from the biotic and abiotic stress as it is in open condition? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, that is also a good question. But uh, we don't have any strategy to deal with such problems. Only thing is, uh, uh, we should pray and. Uh, uh, As you said that you meant we you we you, we, you but, will do uh, our, uh, our field gene bank. What we do is uh, we don't use any chemicals. We yes. go uh, organically. Uh, nature has got its own way of dealing with things. See, for example, if you go to a forest ecosystem. Uh, it is self-sustaining and, uh, you know, there, is, uh, there are pests, there are diseases, but it has got a mechanism to deal with that. But such a system is uh, not there in a, you know, human-made ecosystem. That is, for example, the farming uh, ecosystem that is uh, not there. Uh, but now what is happening, you know, people are changing uh, towards the organic way of sustainable way of uh, cultivation. And in such cases, uh, 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 see, we also notice, see, our gene bank, uh, uh, when others uh, do the spray, all the pest and uh, this has come to our gene bank. That is because of the survival instinct of this uh, species. So uh, best way is uh, you should go for the, uh, you know, a sustainable way of farming and uh, slowly, see, for example, uh, now Sikkim has declared as a, a, a uh, organic state and uh, uh, many other uh, uh, states are so going that way because that is the only way to uh, sustain the system and uh, people should get uh, quality materials without a chemical. But uh, uh, recently, uh, I don't know how many, many of, some of you might have seen Sri Lanka is facing food shortage because they adopted the organic way okay. of uh, cultivation. But uh, I don't believe it is only a media hype. Uh, the, initially, there will be a decrease in the production, but uh, slowly it will stabilize. Uh, it, it may take some time. We have to wait uh, till that time. Uh, because you see, before the uh, chemical, uh, uh, chemical uh, cultivation came, People were eating food and uh, there was no problem, but uh, the problem came because of the population explosion and because of the other environmental uh, problems. So uh, we should see my holistic angle and then we should be able to tackle it. But there is no way to handle the abiotic and abiotic stress in a uh, field gene bank. You should be more, uh, you know, you should uh, have more caution. We should have more, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> better way of handling it. Okay, so, sir, my final question is, uh, Umesh Jain is asking, if we want to save seed for medium term with a, without gene bank facilities, can we store in airtight containers, maybe for three to four years? Please suggest your opinions on these for medium term short storage. See, for example, tomato seed, you can keep it in ambient condition for two years. But the only problem we are going to face is uh, uh, 
uh, you will get less viability after four years. The store, see, for example, I was showing some uh, methods adopted by farmers. See, farmers, they don't uh, use these modern methods, but they have, they normally store it uh, for uh, season to season. And uh, uh, they are able to do it without uh, compromising on viability. The only problem when, uh, when you use such a uh, technique is uh, the, you know, you are compromising on the uh, viability. And another thing is vigor. See, the vigor will be decreased if you don't adopt a good uh, storage methods and uh, the viability also you are compromising. Otherwise, uh, any method of storage is good, but uh, the problem is one is the vigor and there is a viability. Okay. Sir, one more question and there's a request from the participant is, like Sri Lanka, is there any threat to India in the way of organic farming? Sri Lanka? Like Sri Lanka, is there any threat to India in the way of organic farming? No, I don't see the, see, one thing is, don't go by what uh, the newspapers say, because most of the newspapers, they have their own, uh, you know, agenda. See that they, see, they, they, uh, these newspapers are run by the, uh, you know, people who are having some agenda. So they will spread such uh, things. We don't know the actual, in fact, I had been to Sri Lanka. Uh, it, it is like, uh, you know, uh, it's like a paradise. And, uh, you know, the people are so good, but the, there is inflation and uh, uh, there is no industry there. And uh, may, most of the people are in farming only and uh, small holding and uh, uh, people are very good. And the, uh, you know, it's a paradise for the tourists. Uh, the issue, what they are facing is uh, uh, due to the lack of uh, vision, due to the lack of, uh, you know, leadership. I feel, uh, uh, you know, uh, if that is their, their problem uh, can be solved. India, you cannot compare India and Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka is like an Indian state. India is, uh, you know, a big uh, country having a uh, lot of resources and, uh, you know, this next, this century and next century belongs to India only. Uh, and uh, we are able to tackle uh, most of our problems. And uh, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, Sri Lanka is, Sri Lanka, you, you I, I, I mean, now the Indian, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the foreign secretary is going to visit Sri Lanka and uh, we are already got the uh, order to, you know, uh, to have some uh, infrastructure projects, the, uh, the port, the uh, Colombo port, one, the next uh, uh, facility we are going to make. So we are uh, very good friends and uh, uh, we used to help Sri Lanka in a big way, even for uh, to deal with the uh, pandemic also, we helped them. So it's not a threat, they are uh, very friendly to us and uh, it will continue to like, continue uh, like that in the coming years also. Thank you very much, sir, for answering all the questions. Still, we are having a lot of questions, but due to time constraint, we cannot put all of them before you. So we shall no mail problem. you the questions, yeah. what we had. So for your reference, you can just uh, yes, uh, yes, see yes. at any time and you can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Abhigna, Welcome. you can proceed further. Well, so that was extensively informative. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajeshik, for such a flawless progression of events and for illuminating the subject to this extent. Thank you very much. For the next event, I would like to call upon Dr. Sujeshri for carrying forth the interview round. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Abhikna. Uh, first of all, sir, uh, I thank you so much for delivering such an insightful presentation. And it was very dynamic and uh, dynamic scientific presentation as uh, uh, what you have shared. Your work is work very effectively and it will be definitely helping the scientific community, sir. Sir, uh, your passionate concern for biodiversity was clearly evident throughout your presentation. So here now, uh, I have a few questions to you to know your vision and thoughts uh, in various aspects that our audience are really interested to know about you, sir. So my first question is, sir, uh, what has inspired you to pursue a career in plant conservation or biodiversity conservation? I mean, I mean to ask, like, what has been your path to pursuing your PhD in this area? Yeah, thank you, Sujeshri. It's a uh, good question. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, during my childhood, 
see when i was studying up to 10th standard uh, during our uh, summer holidays myself and my uh, mother we used to cultivate vegetables in organic way then uh, you know she used to conserve the seeds for the next season so uh, one is you should be doing farming and uh, we used to have uh, two acres of uh, paddy land then we used to cultivate paddy and the paddy cultivation is a celebration i think uh, i don't know whether you know it it's a celebration and uh, i used to involve in that and we used to have uh, cattle and we used to have cow in fact it is a cyclic uh, uh, way uh, you know it is uh, uh, without the cow without cattle you cannot do farming and uh, all this made me to think uh, you know the uh, and conservation is a way of life conservation will not you cannot start in one day and finish in the next day and uh, uh, if you uh, wanted to conserve uh your life also should you know involve in uh, conservation activities and uh, from the beginning uh, i used to feel that uh, you know conservation is very important and uh, i studied my uh, msc from the uh, department of botany kalgit university it is uh, a mecca of uh, botany we used to have uh, very good uh, teachers and uh, by seeing them i used to feel uh, one day i should be like that and uh, i am not able to follow their uh, footsteps but uh, uh, somehow you know they uh, infuse lot of uh, confidence in me and uh, i followed uh, uh, the footsteps of them and i did my phd in the conservation of uh, rare and endangered medicinal plants and now i could established a uh field gene bank for this species and in fact uh, at, at least 2 uh, 3000s uh, uh, of students used to come from uh, different schools and colleges and uh, they used to see this plant and first time they are seeing this plants and this, and i used to feel they have seen only the andina trees and uh, uh, concrete jungles so uh, i could make a difference and uh, uh, and uh, uh, for five phd's Uh, came from that and uh, 20 uh, uh, msc students and uh, uh, 20 m- 25 m farm students did their work so when you have resources these are the advantages so i am very passionate about uh, that and uh, i continues to be passionate about that and it is a, uh, you know not a work which i can uh, uh, do myself and uh, uh, i am i was really inspired by some of the uh, you know some of my colleagues uh, who do lot of work in this area so i used to uh, feel that i am too small i could have done much better so that is my uh, feeling uh, but i continue to do the same uh, uh, in my life so thank you for that question sir uh, it's really inspiring story that you have come to this area sir my next question is sir uh, sir as you are involved in various collaborative research projects uh, we would like to know like your opinion on uh, what is the integral role of interdisciplinary or multi contextual collaborations for pacing the research and encouraging the innovative dis- uh, developments in our research yeah that is also a very good question uh, see now uh, if you see the good research papers in uh, science and uh, nature and all you can find uh, 50 others 100 others 200 others uh, that is because now uh, you know without collaboration without integration uh, problem solving is not possible you should be in a problem solving mode uh, that, that is possible uh, only with the collaboration and the collaboration is possible one is you should not have any ego and uh, you should be ready to share say uh, people used to approach me for details uh, i used to go i used to give freely because i i don't feel uh, you know it, it belongs to me because i use the uh, taxpayers money for uh, getting all this uh, in fact even uh, getting good salary that is taxpayers money and other facilities is all uh, a tax uh, getting from the taxpayers money so i used to share uh, uh, the material and the knowledge 
uh, whatever I have. So uh, coming back to your question, see the uh, why <clears throat> why we are not in the problem solving mode in many areas is because of lack of collaboration. Uh, and in some of the cases, the collaboration is only for the namesake uh, to get some papers or get some uh, you know money or some uh, positions. But we should be in the real, see, for example, if you uh, wanted to do bioprospecting, we should be in the real collaboration mode. And that is possible uh, if you have good resources, good knowledge, and good uh, attitude. Attitude is very important. You should be able to share uh, your knowledge, your material, and uh, facilities. And uh, slowly now, uh, such a culture is uh, uh, See, uh, for this Madhuka and Signis, I used to have collaboration uh, from the uh, Kew Garden uh, UK. Then uh, uh, my student, uh, he collaborated with all the labs in IHR and uh, uh, with the uh, de Department of Botany, then Etri, all uh, so many places. That's why we could do a good job. Otherwise, if you, if you are doing only in your lab, uh, you can do on very little. And uh, I used to say, see the uh, how collaboration is possible. One is uh, your attitude. Another is uh, your approach. You should be friendly with uh, other people. Other people also should feel that uh, uh, you know they can contribute. Sir, very good vision and thought, sir. Yes, sir. My next question is: uh, So the world has never been uh, aware on the environmental issues or the need to. And there is a need to train and employ the specialist people who, who can help us in reducing the impact and plan wisely for the future. So uh, in conservation, uh, in many of the countries, they are uh, mainstreaming the debate on uh, the need of biodiversity. That is a global agenda for the government organizations and individuals. Sir, according to you, uh, do you have any tips or takeaways for the students who are considering a career in this area, biodiversity conservation or plant genetic resources? Yeah, I feel, uh, see now uh, students are moving towards uh, bio, bio, rather than uh, working on biodiversity, they are moving towards biotechnology. But for biotechnology, you will need to have your resources. See the bio resources you should, you, if you have, you can do bio prospecting. And uh, uh, India is endowed with a very uh, huge biodiversity. Though we are sitting on the gold mine, we are not able to take the gold out of the gold mine because of uh, you know various reasons. Uh, and uh, students are the future, uh, uh, not only future, the present and future of uh, India. And uh, uh, that is happening uh, in in India now. It is happening. See the some of the uh, uh, the universities. Some of the colleges uh, are involved in that. And uh, uh, you can really have a, a good career in uh, biodiversity conservation. But uh, just you talk on conservation, it is not going to happen. You have to practice it. And uh, practicing it is, uh, you know, uh, difficulty. And uh, uh, what I have seen is, uh, see, people put a white coat and sit in front of the computer or sit in front of the PCR, and uh, they think that is what uh, uh, the real work. That's not. They should go to the field. See, for example, if you take my uh, work, see, uh, till '97 we were not going to the field. We were working only in the lab. Then I, you know, we started the exploration. We started the establishing in the field. That helped me to understand the dynamics of the plants. See, if you want to understand the plant, or if you understand, if you want to understand any species, uh, you should go to its natural habitat and uh, do it. So uh, the uh, <clears throat> the best way to uh, have a career in uh, biodiversity is uh, you should do a lot of field work, but uh, that is lacking because of, uh, you know, it involves a lot of risk. But what I found in uh, US and the other countries, they are uh, uh, much involved in uh, such work. And uh, I happened to visit, uh, uh, when I was visiting USA, I happened to visit the national parks. 
see the national parks uh, there are uh, you know the uh, the uh, lot of biodiversity uh, conservation is happening there and they integrate uh, all the techniques say for example cryopreservation in vitro conservation all part of a, a national park and uh, i happen to see you know so many retired people they uh, come as volunteers there and they share their uh, vision with the young people and uh, the people working in this area should be very passionate don't see as a you know a job you should be passionate when you have passion uh, you can do whatever you want if you are not passionate it is it is not the money involved it is the passion take you forward so uh, for the young people uh, if you wanted to pursue uh, biodiversity first you should have a passion second you should have you should able to do a lot of field work and uh, you should find your interest in uh, such uh, species then uh, you can make it as a career otherwise uh, not possible No audio. I'm your yes, mute. Sir. Yes, sir. It's a it is a good guidance from your side, sir. My next question is, sir. Uh, sir, biodiversity strategic planning, as you have discussed, uh, it is a sustainable development contest, uh, and sir, it is a need of time globally. Sir, as you have explored several nations and engaged in various investigations and workshop on these aspects, can you share like uh, the biodiversity conservation strategies of India compared to other nations, as you have told about USA? yeah there's again a good question see uh, india as i mentioned it is a very complex situation here and uh, i i was traveling in northeast like uh, in uh, assam in uh, meghalaya uh, i found uh, you know uh, they are all depending on biodiversity for their daily daily livelihood so uh, if you uh, five o'clock if you go Uh, in uh, near the forest you can see people are taking the bamboo because bamboo is part of their life uh, and they are cutting uh, you know uh, uh, <clears throat> cutting it and taking it and uh, there is no replacement so then uh, by the it is a biodiversity hotspot the entire northeast and it is now uh, completely wiped out uh, the issue there you see now uh, everything we are commercializing without uh, you know any regulations so that is one problem another thing is uh, the people are not aware if is if forests are not there what is going to happen how you deal, how you are going to deal with the climate change how you are going to deal with the natural calamities so the biodiversity conservation see it should be taught from the beginning the students should aware without biodiversity uh, we don't have a life because it is uh, intermingled with our life though even if even if you go to the uh, say what i noticed in uh, us and all uh, i happen to visit two three national parks see they are uh, so much concerned about the conservation and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, their conservation strategies are uh, much better see though we have a lot of biodiversity uh, the problem is too many cooks spoil the broth see the mainly the uh, uh, the ministry of uh, environment forest and climate change are involved in the in situ conservation but these are all uh, ruled by the bureaucrats they uh, you know they don't have much vision and the scientists are taken uh, you know back seat and uh, another issue is you know you see we have the national biodiversity authority and ba based in chennai uh, what i found uh, they are only creating problem for doing research see for example now i have another project on selacia uh, selacia species from national medicinal plant board i have to do the exploration i have to take permission from the karnataka forest department uh, 3 months back i have sent a request for uh, getting this permission they have now called me for a presentation on 12 it took 3 months for them to take an action 
and uh, without that i cannot do the exploration so for research it is a impediment uh, this biodiversity uh, uh, authority is an impediment uh, they are not able to see the problem is ease of doing uh, business is there so like that ease of doing research also we should have they should not uh, put any impediment for uh, doing research and uh, uh, because of this there is a uh, you know a lot of delay and we are not able to uh, do any exploration because we don't have the permission so without permission you cannot enter into the forest uh, areas so uh, what i mean to say is our uh, strategies are impediment to do research our strategies are not helping the conservation and you can see the uh, you know we have uh, uh, almost 180 environment laws in india and uh, you see the condition of our environment with all this we have a lot of good rules but uh, the uh, implementation of the same is very limited the problem is uh, we have a large population another is we we don't have a committed uh, you know uh, staff for uh, implementing this and everywhere corruption is there uh, but uh, in my view things may change uh, there are uh, uh, good people in the system they may uh, they may be they may able to change it and uh, when new people occupy the position i think it will be much better uh, time is up and uh, uh, we have to do with this yes sir you have told it rightly sir my last question uh, for yeah. you is Sir, uh, in the early research career, sir, that there are many problems like uh, manuscript rejections due to various reasons can happen. So structuring it in a proper and a logical framework is very important. So as an expert, sir, our audience research scholars, they would like to uh, hear from you the expert advice in producing a quality manuscript that uh, communicates the science uh, nicely. And also, yeah. sir, uh, mm -hmm. and also, sir, I would like to combine one more question like, uh, you have to express like sir how you feel about our platform and our organization sir yeah the first part of the question is very important uh, uh, as your uh, ceo was telling uh, your next uh, venture will be on uh, uh, <clears throat> on that aspect see how to write a good research paper and uh, publish in a high impact journal uh, here I would like to stress two, three things. One is, uh, uh, see, you should have uh, good concept. See, the conceptualization is missing in any student. Say, I was dealing with uh, uh, MSc students, PhD students. In fact, uh, all um, almost uh, now I think six, seven batches of PhD students, including you. Uh, you will be, I think, uh, in the first 10, uh, rest of the, uh, I mean, first 10 means uh, if I, uh, I think some 70, 80 students, if you take, so you are a good communicator. Uh, Thank you, sir. First thing is, uh, most of the students don't have a concept. See, how you form the concept? Uh, see, uh, to form a concept, you should have a good knowledge. And uh, uh, from where you get knowledge, see, you would you will be uh, you know reading a lot and discussing uh, the aspects with your colleagues and uh, your mentors and teachers so that will help to have a good uh, concept see before doing any research because i i found that was totally missing in most of the students so uh, any student come to me for uh, doing research first i will do you know two three days i will discuss with him uh, what is his uh, knowledge level or what is his communication level once you have the concept uh, uh, then you can uh, develop a research uh, a research problem you can develop and uh, uh, once you have a uh, this research problem you do the experiment and uh, collate the data and then you start writing this research paper see research paper writing uh, first before writing you should see collect all the concerned literature and uh, uh, a thorough study should be 
done and uh, uh, from my experience what i found is say the uh, uh, when i started doing research i collected all the research papers in that aspect and uh, i uh, wrote a review and i used to tell the same thing same thing to the students and uh, some of them have uh, followed that and they wrote a good uh, review and published in uh, uh, good journal so when you do that review you you understood the uh, you know nitty gritty of uh, that aspect and uh, you will be able to uh, appreciate it much better and uh, uh, once you finish your uh, in fact what i found is uh, uh, you should start writing when you are doing it sir see when if you wait till you finish your uh, research some aspect you will be missing so uh, the documentation of research is very important and uh, many students are uh, failing in that they think that uh, you know uh, they will able to uh, write a good uh, uh, thesis or good research paper one example i tell you uh, this happened in uh, uh, this year only see one of the uh, phd student uh i i are a student only uh, he was working on cryopreservation pollen uh, and i am not a member or i am uh, i am not uh, <clears throat> not not related to that but uh, i helped him to do the work uh, once the work is over he wrote the paper and brought to me that is because the one of one of the earlier student uh, he was I, there in his committee i was a member he uh, published a good paper in uh, you know uh, south uh, in uh, south african journal of botany that is a good uh, journal uh, and uh, five times i corrected it and uh, he could publish it and this uh, this student told him if you wanted to publish you approach rajeshagran sir he will help you then he came to me uh, and i uh, started seeing that paper and uh, i found it is so badly written there is no english and there is no uh, you know it, there was uh, references from uh, 1880 uh, and i told see you should have reference only 2000 and uh, uh, above not uh, after that because science has progressed so much then i took uh, one week to get uh, you know to give a shape and uh, i was surprised his guide and other members uh, they also seen this paper but uh, you know they have not uh, able to do it properly i mean they are all my good friends i have uh, you know there is no bad feelings about them but i keep that separately and this sign separately and uh, uh, once it is corrected and uh, we sent to the uh, science horticulture and uh, uh, they give uh, you know uh, two referees commented and uh, we got the comment then again uh, you know we corrected it and sent to them but uh, to his bad luck after the correction they rejected it Reje- the reason best known to them they then i told him see he was completely disheartened i told see this is only you have to take it as a uh, you know education as a, you know don't get disheartened this is uh, a, you know it's testing your patience testing your knowledge and this. then i told sir i will do it and then uh, you know i suggested another journal that is journal of biology he <coughs> made changes and sent to journal of biology and uh, uh, within one month he got the comments they asked for some uh, revision and uh, he told sir i will do it after one month. i told you know uh, you cannot do like that uh, you do it tomorrow and bring it tomorrow uh, do it today and to bring it tomorrow he did it and uh, he brought and uh, he sent to them within one week he got the acceptance and now it is published in uh, journal of cryobiology and i tell you that has changed him a lot now he is a different person he uh, he started uh, sending uh, recently i got one of his paper uh, you know in, uh, in the he sent to journal of uh, uh, 
plant genetic resources published from uh, UK. That is also he returned well, but there are some issues. I mentioned that, and uh, and he, he don't know that I was uh, revealing this, and I I tell him also because it's all confidential. Now what I'm telling is, uh, getting published and not getting published, it is only you know a, a slight difference, but uh, that make lot of difference. You should be persistent. You should be uh, having lot of patience. and uh, uh, you know it is a learning experience and many people fail to learn it because one uh, rejection will uh, uh, they think that uh, uh, they don't know anything but it's not like that it is their opinion you should take the uh, advantage of it and uh, change it and uh, now i found the confidence level is uh, very high uh, in fact he was not knowing to write even a single sentence properly but from that stage now he himself put him in a you know uh, because of one paper is a uh, friend was telling me sir he is now completely different he uh, talked differently i mean the way he communicate uh, was completely different after the acceptance you know what i mean to say is uh, it is a learning process everybody should undergo it and i really appreciate you uh, <clears throat> the ceo for uh, you know taking that uh, because that is very much required uh, in fact when i started my career i was also belonging to that category i was not knowing uh, how to write a paper and then i uh, started uh, you know reading uh, because some of the papers will be really inspiring you and uh, that you read it and understand it in fact uh, uh, that will help you to make up become more confident and uh, you will be able to write good papers and publish and uh, coming to the other question that is what is my uh, uh, take on your this platform i feel uh, you uh, are doing a good job i really appreciate because i know sujayashri when she was here uh, she is a good communicator uh, good knowledge about the subject and uh, wanted to and uh, recently i saw her uh, review also uh, it was well written uh, i i feel uh, you know with uh, uh, you people joining together and helping others uh, this kind of uh, platform is really required and i really appreciate you uh, and i was happy that uh, i could join you i don't know about uh, you know my lecture and my other aspects will really help you or not but uh, it was inspiring for me uh, to be part of uh, your platform and i wish all the best to all your endeavors and uh, uh, thanking you all of you for giving me this opportunity i really enjoyed Uh, in fact uh, uh, for uh, me each presentation i take it uh, you know uh, as a challenge and uh, uh, now i would like to inform you in uh, november we are going to uh, conduct an online uh, uh, <coughs> course for horticultural genetic resources uh, conservation i invite all of, in fact uh, uh, we are just waiting for the uh, final uh, Uh, brochure then i will send to you and uh, it will be a five day uh, event uh, it will be involving some uh, uh, very good lectures from the uh, you know uh, people who can really inspire because i used to select uh, the resource person who can really the question is you see one so you are inspired only you can inspire others so i used to select the inspiring people to inspire the uh, others in fact uh, uh 2016 i conducted a summer school uh, which was very successful and my the springer book was uh, uh, the product of that thing in fact that inspired me to have this uh, volume so uh, looking forward to uh, for uh, conducting the uh, uh, online course for five days and a uh, five day uh, it is a tight program Uh, uh, every day we'll have uh, 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 some you know from morning 10 to evening 4 o'clock with one hour break half an hour lectures and all these lectures will be from the experts of the field so i invite uh, you people to join that class 
So thank you. Thank you, Sujay Sri, for uh, all your questions were well framed. I, you know, uh, I really like the way you did it. I, I, you know, thank you for that. Yes. Thank you so much for this, sir. And it was very interesting interactive session. And uh, we are grateful for your effort you have taken for sharing your thoughts and experience with us, sir. And also, sir, uh, we request your kind future support in our scientific platform for enabling it's us always, to... Sir. Yeah. Yeah, for enabling us to concentrate more in achieving uh, various scientific goals and uh, work effectively, sir. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. Truly an amazing interaction to have waited upon. Thank you, Dr. Sujeshri, for executing the interview that most certainly was quite intricate. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Now, wasn't that a mind-blowing session we had? So thanks a lot. You guys have been a brilliant audience. Reaching the end of this, I would like to clarify the process of attaining the certification for the same. A feedback and certification link has been shared in the chat box and the YouTube comment box as well. You are all kindly requested to go onto the scene, fill it up, register yourselves, and thereafter, within a slot of two weeks, your certificates will be shared accordingly. And if there is some error and you do not receive your certificates after the mentioned time period, kindly visit our official website www.plangenomia.com. Please note that the link is valid only for two hours. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, once again for joining us. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yes, I will leave now. Thank you.